Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention towards your screens and turn up those volumes on your speakers. It is now time to introduce your 2020-2021 State Officer Team. Your Northern Region Vice President, Jack Pine Campus. Your Central Region Vice President, Amy Barch. Your Metro Region Vice President, Kale Hakowski. Your Southern Region Vice President, Madison McDonnell. Your Vice President at Large, Jackson Effelt. And put your hands together for your president, Zach Spohn. Hello, Minnesota Collegiate DECA. Welcome to your 2020-2021 Career Development Conference. I now call our conference to order. Welcome to all Collegiate DECA members joining us for this conference. This year, we have been challenged in ways we could not have foreseen, and we have created a conference that delivers a next level learning, competition, and networking opportunities. We want to extend a huge thank you to all advisors, alumni, and sponsors who have helped made this conference happen. All of you have made it possible for all of us to offer collegiate DECA activities where many things have been a challenge. Thank you for helping our members take it to the next level. Each year, we invite a member of the International Collegiate DECA Officer Team to join us at conference. It is my honor to welcome International Collegiate DECA President, Gage Donovan. Hello, Minnesota Collegiate DECA. As some of you may know, my name is Gage Donovan, and I'm the International Collegiate DECA President for the 2020-2021 Academic Collegiate DECA year. It is an honor for me to be back here speaking to all of you even if this happens to be virtually. My time as a member of Minnesota Collegiate DECA was truly, truly some of my fondest and most valuable memories that I have. This year, we've accomplished so much. At the international level, we've launched the new Collegiate DECA One Diamond Calls, revamped the Passport Program, created new chapter guides, and highlighted our spectacular members. Congratulations to all who have been able to participate. We've also been able to apply for our share of over $250,000 in scholarship money. At the Minnesota Collegiate DECA level, I've had the opportunity to be on Taking It to the Next Level podcast hosted by your state officer team. I was able to speak with all of you at the Virtual Innovation Summit closing session, and so many other wonderful things have happened at the state level. As you're watching this today, you're embarking on a historic journey. You're part of the first ever virtual Minnesota Collegiate DECA Career Development Conference. What an incredible opportunity and honor. I know that it can be easy in these pandemic times to become complacent and not truly commit, but Collegiate DECA has opened a world of opportunities for myself, and I promise you, if you truly commit, it will do the same for you. This is not the first virtual conference that we've been having and we are certainly the wiser because of it. Be sure to always have your laptop charged, be dressed for success, mute your mic when you aren't talking, and let's take this conference to the next level. Thank you, Gage. We hope that everyone finds this conference engaging, informative, and exciting. We also would like to encourage you all to take this opportunity to network with your fellow Collegiate DECA members. Connecting with other students across the state is just one of the many reasons why Collegiate DECA is amazing. As any alumni can attest, a well-established network not only helps you now, but also in the future as each of you step into your role as a leader in the world of business. Make sure to attend each of the sessions, trade contact information with members, and expand your network throughout the conference. Now I'd like to welcome Kale to the podium. Thank you, Jack Pine. And thank you to everyone for being part of our conference. If at any time during the conference you have a question or need information, please email us at mncoldeca at gmail.com. We will be able to provide you with the right information. Now, we ask we ask you to please join us as we sing our national anthem. 
Now I welcome Amy. Thank you, Kale. Each year we honor one of our outstanding advisors with the Advisor of the Year Award. This year's recipient has been a mentor, a role model, and an impactful educator. In the words of her nominator, she cares deeply about her students, cares about delivering high quality learning experiences, and cares about their success. She's made a significant difference in students' lives and, and works hard to encourage and support students throughout their educational journey. She meets individually with each of her advisees several times throughout the semester, works tirelessly at finding resources for students to help in their education, sees potential in each and every student, and works diligently so each student succeeds. Every year, she coordinates multiple field trips and events to enrich students' learning experience and puts in countless hours of her personal time for these events to, to be a success. She's an involved DECA advisor and tirelessly helps students prepare for these events, coordinates local chapter activities, and is always willing to chip in when needed. She works closely with several regional high schools at Career Days, attends many college fairs, and coordinates several tech prep courses, and always advocates for DECA at these events. Her caring attitude for students spills over to everyone she touches. She is the ge genuine, kind, and compassionate. She is the hardest working person we have ever known. Please join us in congratulating Alexandria Technical and Community College Advisor Chris Davey. Congrats again, Chris. And now here's Zach with our next award presentation. Thank you, Amy. As we have mentioned, these conferences are not possible without the many alumni and business partners that devote their time and resources to help make Minnesota Collegiate DECA the best that it can possibly be. Without their help, we would not be the largest Collegiate DECA association in the world. To honor their efforts, we award the Outstanding Service Award to an alumni or business partner who has consistently gone above and beyond the call of duty to serve Minnesota Collegiate DECA. This year's recipient has served as a student officer, a business partner, an alum, and a member of the board of directors. He is the master of Wu and lends those talents to nearly every conference as officer coordinator and serves as an advocate for DECA within his company and community. If you know his story, you know how important and transformative his experience was for him and DECA, and he works to make that possible for others. In addition to his advocacy, he and his family have made it possible for DECA members like you to get the most out of your experience by sponsoring conference activities and donating ICDC scholarship funds. Now, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome to the stage Mr. Jake Ward. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, team. And of course, thank you, Minnesota Collegiate DECA. Without you, People like myself would be stuck delivering pizzas thinking that was the best ends to any means they could do. 
DECA gave me insight, gave me joy, gave me competitive happiness, but one thing it also gave me, and the most important thing, was drive. It gave me drive to lead, to run, and to find. I led through the state presidency and sharpened my leadership skills to know that one day I'd be able to lead my own business. I, sh I consistently echo what DECA has given for me, and I will consistently echo what I can give back to DECA. If you've ever been part of an organization such as this, you will know that you have to give back to ensure that future members have the ability to receive the gifts that you receive. I am extremely humbled to receive this award from such an amazing organization and will honor it as one of the best awards I ever won during my tenure with DECA. I will continue to strive to outstandingly assist this organization, whether it be giving time, financial resources, or any other effort that this organization needs. And it's because of what DECA gave to me is why I will continue to give back to it. So again, thank you team, thank you Minnesota Collegiate DECA, thank you to the board, and thank you to everyone who makes these organizations possible. Because without you, there would not be a future as bright as there is one for these kids behind me. So thank you. Before we let Jake leave the stage, we would also like to recognize the Ward Family Foundation for their generous contributions to this conference and to Minnesota Collegiate DECA throughout the years. Without the generous support of the family, we would not be able to provide these next level conferences for all of us to attend and offer ICDC scholarships to the top three finishers at this conference. The Ward family knows how th long reaching impact the DECA has had and they've repeatedly given to make that possible for more members here in Minnesota. At this time, we would like to present the Ward Family Foundation with the Honorary Life Member Award. Thank you. You know, it feels like not too long ago I was at this podium talking about what this organization has done for me. Of course, that's a joke to all you guys watching this today. But I want you to know that the Ward Family Foundation believes in DECA. They believe in what it does for our youth, and they believe what it will do for our future. My family felt like they were already part of the DECA family. They saw what this organization did for me and the drive and instilled within my business ventures. Now, being a lifetime honorary member, my family is truly blessed to be welcomed into the DECA family. We will continue to support, to be here, and to help with whatever this organization needs. Whether it be helping create the first ever, first ever virtual conference for CDC, which a crazy year it has been, but all you watching, can't wait till you guys see what we got going on for you. Or if it's when ICDC doesn't have something prepared for the events and we make sure to step up and provide a challenge that gives students the opportunity to still compete. The Ward Family Foundation is here for that reason. Our family has been blessed with financial opportunities and we're not one to sit back and let that be within our own family. We're here to continue to help to reach out and to find ways that we can boost our Minnesota nature to be the number one state in the nation. So all you remember that when we go to ICDC, we wanna see those awards, we wanna see those plaques, and we wanna make sure that Wisconsin knows we're coming for them. So thank you guys. Congratulations and thank you again, Jake. Connecting to our members and partners through social media has never been easier. As you take part in these activities during the conference, we encourage you to snap, post, and tag your experiences. Tweet your thoughts, Instagram your photos, and update your Facebook status to connect with other Collegiate DECA members and our partners. Use the hashtag MNCDECA2020 to take part in the fun. As you are communicating through social media during the conference, we would like to remind you that the companies and businesses we are interacting with are looking at you and Collegiate DECA. So make sure you are putting your best foot forward in promoting yourself and Collegiate DECA as business professionals. We would also like to recognize all of our gracious sponsors who not only donated money, but also time to our organization. 
Without you, we would not be able to continue having an amazing conference. At this time, we'd like to introduce the candidates for the 2021-2022 State Officer Team. Abby Lindstead, Northern Region Vice President, Minnesota State University, Moorhead. <laughs> Sebastian Ahumada, Vice President at Large, Alexandria Technical and Community College. <laughs> Megan Matusik, President, Minnesota State University, Moorhead. <laughs> Agua Wapa, President, Southwest Minnesota State University. To find out more about your state officer candidates, make sure to join them at 3 p.m. today for the Meet the Candidate session via Zoom. This session will also be recorded and uploaded to YouTube. And if you want to run for state office, make sure you contact your advisors. All right. Now, you in, in the computer screen there. Yeah, that's right. I'm talking to you. We ran for state office and look at this beautiful group of people. It has been so much fun to be a part of this officer team and I know you wanna do it too. It wasn't that hard to apply, so make sure you apply. I'm, I'm serious. All right, back to the fun stuff. Uh, next up, we have Kale. Thank you, Amy. Each year, our advisors recognize up to three students per chapter who have displayed community involvement, leadership, professional responsibility, and who are academically prepared. This year, the students recognized will be sent their award at the conclusion of the conference. Congratulations to the following DECA members. Leah Armstrong, University of Moorhead, Minnesota. Lisa Stringham, the University of Minnesota. Thomas Lorenz, Minnesota State College Southeast. Shana Schofield, Alexandria Technical and Community College. Adrian Post, Alexandria Technical and Community College. Sebastian Ahumada from Alexandria Technical and Community College. Colton Lasota from Alexandria Technical and Community College. Colby Peterson from St. Cloud Technical and Community College. Jacob Bertram from St. Cloud Technical and Community College. Zach Spohn from Minnesota State University, Moorhead. David Nibby from Minnesota State University of Moorhead. Travis Russell from Minnesota State University of Moorhead. And Megan Matusik from Minnesota State University, Moorhead. Congratulations to all. I now have the absolute pleasure of introducing our opening session speaker, the CEO of Pantheon Computers, John Stagman. John is an entrepreneur and a leader. He knows what it takes to start, grow, and pivot a company to allow for the best service and longevity. His journey has taken him from a small startup to a large company serving businesses, technology needs across the region. Please welcome John Stagman. Well, good morning, and welcome, to, and thank you for joining us uh, at our state DECA conference. Uh, today, I've got our officers for, for the DECA organization, and I'm so glad you guys could get meet with us. Um, this is a super unique forum, but it's a super unique year, so why don't we try something a little different? Instead of me talking the whole time as a keynote speaker, how about we have a conversation? Why don't we have a conversation a little bit about business and about my entrepreneurial journey, and we're going to stumble on that word all day long because it's a fun word to do, <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of those, those failures that help make some of those successes and how to to get through those times and what it takes to, to run a business. I'm welcoming those questions, that dialogue. I got a chance to meet with these guys this past fall, and we had such a good conversation that we wanna make sure that we brought that message back to you guys. Um, it was fun to do, and these guys are so insightful about what it is the business. I know you have several days of this, and you have some competition, you have other um, specifics in marketing or in finance or whatnot. 
all those pieces can be sewn together because quite frankly, the business as a whole is, is all about those pieces. And so well, why don't we just get started? Like, who is this guy up here talking anyway? Um, I'm a Minnesotan. I, I come from Waseca. Uh, I was born and raised there, um, went to school there, graduated there, met my wife there, uh, had a short stint where I went to college and thought, hey, pre-med would be an awesome place to be, make lots of money, do whatever. Um, my mother was a nurse, and so, you know, healthcare kind of was in that space. And I found that that just wasn't where I wanted to be. I always liked playing with the tech toys, plugging stuff in, making things work. And so when I had that opportunity, I started the business that I'm in. Uh, in 1997, which I knew was well before all of you, but it is in the tech field, and we've had to figure out how to continue to adapt to be relevant. Uh, I'm, I'm there with my wife, Jill. We were married in 2001, just for background. We have three daughters, 15, 13, and 9. And uh, they're the love of my life. And uh, in this stage of my life, when I have, am able to provide for them and provide time and guidance and fatherly love and fatherly disciplines and all the pieces that go with being a good parent, um, I think all those things in my life have led up to this moment. So let's talk a little bit about that. We started in 1997, like I said, and I started with a business partner. Uh, we had 1300 bucks. It was literally our last paychecks from our job. We went to a bank, deposited the money, and said, this is our checking account. This is what we're going to start with. If you've studied business plans at DECA, that's not one. <laughs> Let's not try that. That doesn't work. Uh, you have a lot of work to go through. Um, he was the tech, and I pretty much then ended up doing everything else, and the two of us got started that way. It was great. We're good friends. Uh, we'd hung out together uh, in our first job, and this was kind of the brainchild of, I wonder if we could do something with this. At the end of our first year, we sought an opportunity to uh, start up an internet service provider company. Back in the day, we used dial-up modems in our computers. I feel like I'm talking just to this young, young audience that would have no idea where that comes from. Look it up in the history books, and we're just going to move on. <laughs> We, uh, we then had the opportunity to buy a coffee shop, and uh, it had nothing to do with technology, you'd think, but what was unique about it is back in the day, again, look it up in your history books, but there was a thing called like a cyber cafe. Not everyone owned a computer, not everyone had access to the internet, and so if you went to the coffee shop, there was computers available, kind of like going to the library sometimes if you break your laptop or spill something on it or whatnot. Uh, and so you, you go there to use somebody else's computer, and that's how people would get access to it. And we're not talking ancient history, guys. We're talking like 20 plus years ago is all. The, the, as we went through that process, we learned that we weren't particularly good at that. That got to be very distracting. And so at the end of the day, at the end of the year period of having these other two businesses, we decided we're going to sell the internet company, we're going to sell the coffee shop, we're going to move, we need to get refocused. This isn't working out. And so there's a lot of changes. And so my next slide titled, you know, chapters two, three, four, like what is next? There's all these things that keeps moving on. Uh, my wife is really technically minded. And it was a gift to us because she could get into a technology business. We could spend time together. And at the end of the day, it felt kind of like a curse. I mean, at the, we spent all our time together at the same rate. So it was great for our relationship. It was great for our time. But we never got away from work. And there's a whole other story on how that goes through. But through our history, in 2004, if anyone's from Fairbolt, we opened a shop in Fairbolt in, in this time period, and our lease was three years long, as you can tell by the slide, that's how long it lasted. We, we didn't have the success that we were looking for that we found that we had in Wasika. In 2009, we opened another store in Oatana. This is going to be better, guys. It's nicer, it's clean, it's in a bigger city. We know what we're doing now. Three years later, we close it. But what is the missing component of what we're doing here? And you're asking a little more, like, what, what would be that business? We had a retail store. We, we sold computers residentially. We wanted to get that footprint in a community where businesses recognize us to be experts of what we were doing and would hire us to do their business side of things, too. So we had a bit of that both and going on, and it just wasn't connecting. It wasn't syncing well like we did in Wasika. Again, remember, I'm from Wasika. I knew people from Wasika. They knew of me. Is all that business success only because we knew each other? Why wasn't it working in other towns? And yet, as we fast forward through the rest of things, we'll find out that it did. But in 2011, the bomb dropped. My business partner said, this isn't working for me. I have a family that's growing up. I'm not making enough money. This is too much stress. I'm done. And he goes and gets a job and says, you know, I I'm leaving. What do you do with that? 
And so here I am sitting with, you know, 350,000 of debt and a business is not running particularly well. My top talent leaves me. I'm not the technician. I know enough in there to get by, but I'm certainly not setting up a server configuration and doing whatever gee whiz stuff we do. I could actually tell you what we do. And I've got a newborn at home with two other kids. Like, what next? How do we get through this next phase of, are, are we going to keep it? You know, earlier we were talking about that. Like, is, is that what you want to do? I mean, can you just hang up, throw in the towel and say, well, we're going to bankrupt this thing and go get a job? And yet that's not who I am. That's not how I operate. Uh, first, they wouldn't just leave it. Yeah, to, to your point, it's that you, obviously this isn't who you are. And I think that as I'm looking at your slide here, it's like you have, it, this didn't work, this didn't work, this didn't work, but you kept going at it. Your partner left eventually and still you stuck with it. I think that that speaks to maybe the importance of failing. I think a lot of us grow up and we maybe come from a generation that might be scared to fail. And I think that that's, uh, can be debil de debilitating at times. It doesn't, if you're scared things aren't gonna work out, you aren't gonna take that risk. So maybe John, you can tell us a bit about why taking that risk is important and why maybe we shouldn't be afraid to fail and why those risks are worth taking. Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, um, I just gave you permission. Go ahead, fail, fail, fail a lot. Uh, you know, like Edison says, you know, well, this is just one more way it's not gonna work. I'm gonna find that way that's gonna work. There's something that stirs inside of each of us. And whether you like to play it safe and you're, you're a numbers person or you're uh, I just want to punch the clock person, or, there's still something that stirs in each one of us, whether it be from our hobbies or from our family. Um, this isn't all about business. And I recognize that we're in DECA here talking about business. And so we're going to continue to craft that message there. But each of us has that thing that's going to drive us forward. And so I give you permission to fail in whatever it is. If you're trying your best and you're asking for you know advice and you're surrounding yourself with good people, um, you're definitely going to see that. And we're going to continue with the story. And we're going to see what the results of just keep trying. And what does it take to get the right components in there? And maybe as we get to the end of that conversation, we're going to find out that we could have accelerated some of these failures and not had so many of them, learned by other people's mistakes, when we, when we land at that spot of, hmm, things are running a little better. Tracking a little bit. You said you went to college for pre-med, but did you ever go to college for anything technical or marketing? And then if you didn't, how maybe did that, <clears throat> excuse me, how maybe did that like affect your business? Was it more positive or negative? All right. So I'm going to start from this spot. Get me to come back there if I, I get lost. <clears throat> I used to sit down with our accountant when we first started. And he says, the number one thing you have to do in business is hire people smarter than you. So to answer your question, no, I didn't. I didn't go to college for any marketing. I had no real marketing classes, had no sales classes, had no accounting classes. Like, who am I qualified even to stand on stage right now and tell anyone anything about this? And yet, as we continue to go through our story, it's about that tenacity, it's about that drive, it's about that perseverance of figuring things out and asking for advice. But I think one of the things that makes our company successful is I am not the expert at all these things. I have to hire those people. I have to partner with those people. I have to find those services that I can buy from other people to be that expert because they're just better than, than I am. And there's no way I'm going to be the expert in all these different things anyway. I see other companies uh, of peers of mine that they're the technician or they're the salesperson and other components of their business struggle. And so to have that over, un, overarching umbrella of everything that's going on probably is one of our keys to our success. We kind of talked about it there, but I'll ask it now. I think, John, you showed what an important part of leadership is, is not being afraid to be like, I don't know this, uh, and being secure enough to surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and be willing to lead those people as well. So how does what does that look like when you're surrounding yourself with people that um, you, you, describe, you describe yourself maybe just being humble that are smarter than you, but you're... Show, showing them the way and you're leading your company that way as well. What, what sort of instincts or how does, how, how does that work, I guess, for you and your company? Yeah, that's a, uh, so to, to bring into that conversation, um, humble, certainly. I'm not better than that. I don't know that answer. To seek that answer out, um, to create that partnership, you know, how, 
we've all had these conversations, and and although I've got many years' experience of, of business and life over you guys, I'll still ask your questions because you have a different insight than I do to, to what things are. I have to be open to listen to that. And I think one of the keys that when listening and then making a decision and leading through that is how do we facilitate that conversation? Do I know that I heard you? Can I ask clarifying questions? Can we figure the things out together? I'm gonna write them down. What things are similar to our conversations and how do we paint a picture and get direction? A lot of people talk about getting buy-in from something as a leader. Can I get buy-in from this group to go do this project? I think we have to have an understanding there's a good component, there's a good, great TED talk on buy-in, and he talks uh, quite a bit about that it's not necessary that we have to get everyone to buy into where we're going. Everyone may have different attitudes and, and, and um, thoughts about that, but more so that we hold similar core values, that we ha have a, an end in mind, and how we get there may look different, but to listen and to surround ourselves with those experts and then to build a plan that everyone can, we can move forward with. I uh, think an important thing just to touch too on that is that when you allow yourself to surround yourself with those experts, um, you're giving them a chance to be a leader too. And I think a really, really uh, effective way of building a team is to have everyone be a leader in their own way. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, the consensus building is definitely a good way to lead, I think, too, because while you, you are in charge of this team, you are in charge of this company, being able to like you said, bring in all those experts and then have different ideas about how to get there. But once everyone is heard, we have this consensus that we're all agreed to and then we can go forward that way. And I think that that's, if you agree, John, I think that that's really a, a important way and a really useful way to lead and be successful. Absolutely. So we're talking a lot about experts here and how like you brought them on. What qualities were you looking for when bringing somebody on? Were you looking more specifically for a specific trait or something they could bring to the table or were you looking at more like the big picture overall because you wanted them to fit in multiple areas of your company? Certainly. A lot of different perspective there. So on one side, as I'm having some of these failures in our story of, of this journey, uh, we're getting to that spot where we're talking about how do I seek some of those experts out? So we're talking about, um, for my case, I end up finding a peer group. People that run similar businesses to me somewhere else that we're not competitive, so we can be super transparent with each other, be very honest and open with each other, and discuss what's working in our businesses. So there's one example. Somebody who's running something similar. You know, we've talked about some of your dreams about different types of businesses, what you wanna do. Finding peers, this whole group is a peer group, right? These people are in your spot looking for that next thing that you're gonna do. Find people that you relate to, you connect with, have similar goals, similar values, and have those conversations. Where are you going with this? It is even good to have a bit of healthy competition in that space, right? Like, oh, I'm doing pretty good this year. How's your sales doing? Whatever we're talking about. You know, have you found the magic tool that works for your accounting practice that you can see better into your numbers? Whatever geeky thing you're gonna get into in your business practice and what you're gonna do in life, find those people that you can peer. So pe finding peers is, is key to, to finding some of those experts. They're experts because they do what you do and you can be better and sharpen each other's swords through, through those dialogues. So that's a great place to start. Other places, like recently, I've hired a business coach for myself. No, I'm not that smart, guys. I, I, I execute well, I have the right people around me, but I've got to that next spot where I wanna find somebody who else has done this and done it really well, like 10X, 30X from where I'm at and has done this over a period of time. So I've hired somebody to do that. And his insights are incredible. He pushes the envelope quickly. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, well, should I hire the sales guy or should I wait until operations catches up? And he's like, do both. Yeah, okay, this guy was, success you know, how do I do that and not run out of cash? But you've got this, you've got, there's a lot of moving parts, but he thinks of them all because he's already done that. So somebody like an expert like that. Accounting wise, do I hire my own accountant inside our practice? Our practice is 22 people large. I have a bookkeeper, uh, a controller, somebody can do that. I don't need an accountant on staff. That's, it's not a full-time position. So I partner with the right accounting firm that understands what I'm doing, what my goals are. A lot of questions about that too in building partnerships. You know, do they see your vision? Do they, do they practice what you're doing and where you wanna go? Are they listening to you, not just having their own craft? So peace to that. A lot of different partnerships. Um, so also, too, I, we might talk about this later as well, but when you were starting up your business and trying to bring people on, 
what was one thing that you really pushed or like an incentive to bring people on? Because you, you were a new business starting up. I'm sure people are a little bit nervous to take that risk of partnering with somebody that they don't know whether it's going to be a success. So kind of what was your strategy to get them to come on with you? I smirk a little bit because I think of the fake it till you make it statement. <laughs> and there's pieces to that, right? Um, but you do a lot of work. You do a lot of background work. You study a lot. You read a lot of books. You're trying to be the best version of yourself every day. And that never quits. But when you're starting out, yeah, how do you bring on the right people? We've grown, as we've grown through that business, there are certain people that just haven't, uh, were good for us in one spot and are different for us in a different spot. And are they growing toward that? And can we talk about career development? So sometimes just casting the vision alone, hey, this is where I'm going, would you like to come with me? People get energized by that. I hold a quarterly meeting with our staff, uh, we call it the state of the business, and I talk about our successes, I talk about our finances, and I talk about where we're going every quarter. And that energizes people. They wanna be on part of a winning team. So even when we're talking as a startup, how do you bring that first person on? How do you bring that next person on? Where are we gonna go with this? Casting a lot of vision, and, and bringing people along for the journey that excites them. So quick question, because I kind of relate to it. Well, not kind of, I really relate to it. Recently, I've been hired for an office job, and you're talking about new hirees. During this time, um, with working from home, I don't know your current, so if your team isn't, um, then that's yeah, relevant. We are. But then, yes, um, for hiring new people, how do you keep your team a team while introducing a new coworker. I love this, this is great. So I, I've seen this across our country, I've seen this in Canada, I've seen this uh, in Minnesota, I've seen it in rural Minnesota versus the Twin Cities. It's such a mixed bag. So when we got the first orders to, to work from home, stay at home, uh, through our technology, we could. And I live in my hometown, so when the UPS driver brought stuff, I just showed up at the office and took care of that kind of business. And it was interesting because we just started to dabble into using Zoom, using Teams, when people were remote or they're gone for the day, maybe they had to stay home with a sick child or whatnot. Uh, we could put that one individual or that two people or that three people up on screen when the 20 of us gathered pre-COVID. And all of a sudden we had to use that tool to go full on, everyone's from home, everyone's in Zoom, everyone's on a Teams call. We got really good at it quickly. <laughs> And our, we needed to not only for our own practice, but our, biz, our clients lean to us, right, to provide them some type of IT solution to let them do it too. We deployed over 2,500 clients, end users, home within three weeks, including ourselves. And it was the proverbial, everyone just grab the stuff off your desk, put it in your car, and take it home. And how to get everyone in that space. But you're talking about a culture piece. You're talking about how to stay connected. You know, technology-wise, we got them there. And part of that stay connected was using that tech. Sold out of webcams immediately. Sold out of conference. Sold out of, you know, the microphones. Sold out of everything. Couldn't buy any of it. Couldn't buy laptops. Couldn't buy, I mean, for months. We still got back-ordered stuff coming in still here in January and February. Um, from the orders from the summer. So the tech helped in that way. But then how do you do it? You know, think about the HR side of it. How are we connecting with people? One of the ways I felt we connect, you know, when I get a group of people on screen is to ensure that I address everyone by name. I make sure that I make sure that their name is correct too. Some of you might be joining them from their iPhone and they never set up the Zoom app on their iPhone correctly and it doesn't have their name. It maybe have the name of their phone or something. iPhone user, and it doesn't tell me who's on the phone. I want, so making sure that we stay personal, that we connect by name, by face, keeping cameras on, you know, um, putting virtual events together. I've seen some successes there where people have done some awesome dinner parties that way. They ship a box of food, they have a gathering together, they have a chef get on Zoom, and they, what a neat way to do it. Our team uh, kind of voted on different things when we came up with Christmas and thought, what, what could we do with those types of things? Um, we did a gift exchange in a virtual sense. Um, in our office, we have enough space where we have brought people back into the office. We felt like we started losing touch with each other and a little bit of that connectivity. So there, there was going to be a hybrid. There's going to be a blend of that. Can we do that safely in our COVID world? And if we can, we're going to because we get a benefit from it. I've seen other teams go 100% virtual, and they're successful at it too. It, playing off of, the, thank you, John, playing off of Madison and Amy's question a little bit, you talked about how you're, 
culture has really benefited you in during COVID and every and everything we've had to deal with that way. Let's I'll, I'll go back to Amy's question a little bit. As you were first bringing on those people it, after once when you started Pantheon and you were growing after a little bit and you started bringing on new folks. Fast forward to now, is that sell easier to get people on board with your vision? Have you, um, is, is it because of stuff you've learned with your, how to improve your culture? Is it just because you're having more success after, after the many years of trying? Um, what, what has helped you, helped you and your culture improve over the years? You know, one of the things that I've noticed as our company grows is how much we feel more corporate about things. When we were smaller, I could give these one-off specialties to you. You know, oh, you can take the company car home because your car broke down or something. That's fine. You know, oh, I'll cover your cell phone piece because that's the way I'm going to compensate. Like, we have to be much more corporate. There's going to be rules, and this is how they, because it's just there's more people there, and, and we have to have a, a standard to that. And yet, how do we do that? How do we bring in people for interviews? And I really like you as a salesperson. I really like you as a salesperson. We're going to offer a job to somebody, but who did we connect best with? And that gets to our core values. You know, when we want to connect with people, we've set out what our core values are there. And we're going to tell you up front. We live by these core values. You're uncomfortable by them. I know you want a job, but I guess what? This is going to be miserable for you come six months down the road. And so that's one of the ways we connect to people today is they want to work for us. You know, we're paying maybe more money than we used to. We're, we've got a better uh, retirement program. We've got a good health care benefit. Like, we've matured in all those places to be a real business, if you will. But at the end of the day, I really want great team players, not just somebody getting a job with the cool benefits package and the good pay and the whatever else. We want the best. And I think by cultivating that culture with those people and hiring people with like minds to those core values, we just build that next winning team. Everyone wants to be there. Good question to where we are. I have more slides to tell stories, but I think there's some really good stuff here. Maybe I'm going to touch a couple bullet points. And we'll see what other kind of questions come up. All right, so we're in a story where, where things are falling apart, right? And I was typing this up. Like, I literally cried, and then I whined. Because remember, this is falling apart on me. You know, business partner leaving, what are we going to do with that? And we've talked about some of the successes that we are having today, but that's not how I felt then. I had to start talking to people, and this is back to that partnership. Who do you talk to? Who do you trust? And so I sat down with some people that I really trusted and said, what, what now? You know, you'd asked before, you know, why didn't you just quit? I mean, when does the time where you just throw in the towel and say, no. One gave me a lot of encouragement, and the other one just told me to quit whining. You know, he told a story of his dad running a veterinarian clinic, and his partner left, and that was tough for him, and they had a lot of debt, and his dad built up through that. That was a sense of encouragement, although he basically told me to quit whining about it. I heard his story, and he said, you know, that they, there is success. You, you have that drive in you, John. You can do that. And so we moved on. And so I did. I decided to move on. And it was funny, we were doing the preview of these slides, right? And we we're all smirking a little bit because I looked up here and I says, building more without making more. Wait, no, th that's not where we're going with this. And yet, that was the truth. We kept building up. We kept buying things. We kept moving on with buying another IT company. I had owner payments for my previous uh, partner, and then I bought a company. We're making a little money, no free time. I mean, this is, this is the entrepreneurial story that you're going to hear time and time again. And, you know, you ever seen that chart that just kind of goes from the lower left to the upper right? And it's like, oh, it's just a nice straight line. You know, this is how growth was. No, it's, you know, these peaks and valleys and these way valleys. And this is the time where it's that valley. What do you do different? And there's got to be some magic formula. And I got to tell you, there never is. There's never the magic pill. There's never the magic formula. There's never the thing you can just buy and it just solves the problem. You have to persevere through, through that. And so I, this is where we talk about our peers. I found a peer group that was inside of my industry. And it was a really good formula that somebody else had come up with, and I decided to join in. We meet quarterly. We talk about our business metrics for our industry. And there's a lot of leadership development in that. And that got us through those, those tough times. Within a couple quarters, we turned, turned things around. Um, I have a slide somewhere else, but it says that, you know, we laid off about a third of our staff. And it's like, how do you do that? 
and, and let people go. I mean, it's really important for me that we provide a good quality of life for our staff. And yet this was not a healthy business. We were gonna have no staff soon if we didn't change something. And so we had some pretty honest and hard conversations with some folks and all of them thrived in their next space. I stayed in touch with them. I really do care, but we're, none of us were gonna have jobs if we kept on with the path that we were doing. We would end up analyzing our business and finding out where we were making money and where we were losing significant money and we ended up closing a retail center. It didn't make sense in the way society was transitioning to how they're purchasing computers, how they're getting them fixed, how in inexpensive they're getting, that it made, sen made almost no sense to have a retail center. So we chose to close that. Uh, and then we got really focused on our businesses. We knew that if we could get, and there's different solutions in our industry for different types of clientele. And if we could focus our energy to similar things that our peers were having success with, I thought maybe we would have some success there. So we were able to have those those conversations. Um, so yeah, you talked about your pivot and how you move toward uh, a business B two B sort of approach a little bit. Before that, you talked you talked about how you progress. It wasn't that straight line. We talked about it's the peaks, the valleys, the peaks of valleys, the peaks of valleys. You talked about some things that helped you get made move ahead so that there was growth, your peer groups, and everything like that. But when you are in those peaks and then you're in those valleys, what made you yourself stick with this vision that you had? Was it your, is it just simply your self-belief in yourself of this is what I have, this, this is what I want to do, this is what I'm going to do? Or is it something else? Is it the people you were working with at the time? What made you go through it through like those valleys, like we said, that the wasn't the, was, was not the easiest of times? Yeah, I kind of want to jokingly say I probably couldn't get another job. <laughs> I had no other skill. <laughs> I had no other sense of education. Like, where am I going to get a job and what the heck am I going to do? Um, likewise, I think I'm not going to be a very good employee. Like, if I ever would give this up for some reason, I don't know who I could work for. It would have to be somebody with huge vision and sees that value. And at that time, I didn't feel very valued. And I didn't feel like I had something to offer to get a job. I think I probably had to do it just out of sake that I had to do it. Um, I also didn't want to leave something in a bankruptcy. That didn't make sense to me. That's not, that's not a value that I could, that I hold. I recognize why it needs to be there for certain people and certain businesses. It wasn't to that point where that I needed to exercise that type of exit strategy. And so uh, I think I just had to do it, you know, and it was w wired within me. And so uh, I don't know if I have a good answer besides I just had to do it. No, and I think that that's just the, just how some people are wired or that's the case where you bet on yourself and you're going to see it through no matter what really. Yeah, come heck or high water, right? It's, it's going to work somehow or another. Um, but by having some direction finally and having some hope and having some encouragement and having some people just say quit whining, you just move on. You know, you've gotten, you've gotten past that. And so we got to connect with these peers that have started to run their practices better and could show me a bit of the way. Talk about laying off some staff because my head count was too high for what we were making. You know, learning about a, a service called managed services in our industry, how to sharpen what we do and do it better um, and, and learn some of those important lessons. Um, go ahead. And we might talk about this a little later, but talking about the, the peaks and the valleys, how did it feel to be on top when you came back from this and you said, we're back, we can do this. How did that feel for you to be back up on top? Yeah, you know, I mean, you have your good days and back on top. I'm not sure what day I was ever on top, but there was a couple of days where, you know, like you made a good purchase, you made a good sale, something in there, you made a great hire. Um, we built a, you know, we bought a building and built it out. Those days felt great in our startups. These valleys, you know, were tough days. How did you feel when you came out of that? Pretty good, but I gotta say, you know, I still, at night, I sleep pretty well, but I have a lot of good ideas, and I have a lot of things that I wanna chase, but I also know that I'm responsible for 22 other families. You know, the income and the, uh, what we do and the benefits and all the pieces that go on in our world, you know, whether taxes change or uh, supplier challenges. So there's still a lot of weights on my shoulders, so it, you'd never quite feel like you're, you're quite there. On the other side, it was a good year. We we're busy, we, we, we grew a lot and we grew correctly. We didn't just grow in body count, but we also watched you know, new clients come on um, and through COVID and it's been a challenging year. And I feel for those businesses that didn't have that opportunity to be able to go there, 
our technology field, provided you're willing to work for it, provided you put the time into it, again, another success that you feel good at the end of the year saying, hey, we helped a lot of people this year. There's also, you, you talk about feeling, the feeling on top, the feeling on bottom, you don't know it's bottom necessarily. You won't know it's bottom until you're at the top. And then from then, you go bottom again and you will never know. You're always climbing and decaying and you just analyze what you did. You did two businesses, three years each. A repeat, you did a successful three years, you know, so you knew you could push and do better. So it's always bettering yourself and that's where you kind of pulled yourself through, I believe. So yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. There's there's always that next step and you, you do have to remember those successes. And I think one of the things that's interesting about this quarterly rhythm that I talk about is that these folks get together and make sure that we celebrate our, our successes. You know, And that's why I carry that over to our state of the business meeting. I wanna make sure that we celebrate those successes. We wanna remember those times that we had really good days because the next meeting that we have is our quarterly strategy meeting. And we talk about all the problems we're having and weaknesses and where can we grow. And we always bring all those pieces to opportunities. These are opportunities to make the business better. And we have a whole chart, which I'd love to do a different session on, of just how to build out what are you, how are you gonna prioritize the things that you need to be working on. Uh, but, but that's the next meeting. So we're gonna start with celebrations and where we've, go, where we've been and what things have been successful and where we're going. But how are we gonna get there is to tackle some of those challenges. So you mentioned a little bit about um, opportunities that you wanna do, prioritizing different things. How do you decide what new ideas that you wanna bring to the table or opportunities or things that you wanna tackle? How do you decide or what is your process more importantly about what should take priority and what you should start? Or if you're bringing a new idea to the business table, how do you know if it's gonna be a good one? And what's your process, whether it's you or your team, to know whether or not it would work? I know everything's a risk, but you also wanna make sure that there's a little bit or a good chance of success as well. Since you are a business and a very successful business, you don't wanna bring that down in any way. How, what's your process on that? Sure. I'm gonna describe my process, but I wanna also recognize that there's lots of different sizes and lots of different types of businesses that will have different processes. Two owner operation, little different process. <laughs> uh, you know, a 10,000 uh, person organization, maybe a little different process. At our 20 plus people right now, and I can see this process working through 50, through 100, through maybe 200, um, you've got a visionary. A lot of times it's the owner, hopefully it's the owner. Um, but sometimes you get a good general manager or somebody who has a lot of vision that wants to, to run things forward. Uh, one thing we have to avoid is bright shiny object syndrome. Things look fun to do, uh, but we have to vet those things. I think that's what you're really talking about. In our business, we follow an entrepreneurial operating system or EOS. And in that process, we talk about a visionary and an integrator, and we have a same page meeting every week. And so all these crazy ideas, wherever I've been, however I've been influenced, wake up in the middle of the night with something, I write them down and I bring them to that meeting. And we vet those kind of things. Now, some of them require some R&D. So maybe it's a technical solution that we need engineers to get involved in. Some of them might be a marketing thing and we need to go test that and market. Sometimes it might be me calling up some peers saying, hey, I was thinking about how we could strategize this different Office 365 environment and do whatever because they've done it. Oh, John, we've done that, it doesn't work so well. This is one way I'd try that, John. We've had some success there. So again, back to partners and, and who you surround yourself with that. Um, definitely looking at the finance side of things, like is this gonna make any money? How do we charge for that? What is it gonna cost us to do? When do we get a return on investment if we have to do the research and development of it and we spend tens of thousands of dollars first and then we do something else? Every business is gonna be very different too. Those who are building stuff, they're gonna look at that long-term play like they've gotta make enough money 20 years from now to pay for that whole building process, whether they're laying cable on the ground or building you know, uh, uh, widgets or they're building vehicles or they're building a plant or those things, you've really gotta put it through that financial lens too. So I don't know if we've talked about it, you may have mentioned it briefly, briefly, but you keep talking about your vision for Pantheon and everything else. What is your vision? Like what do you want to do and make the impact that you're looking to make? Sure. At our core, I always wanna make sure that our customers can run their businesses better through the use of technology. That's it. 
Like, let's start there. Let's make sure that they're being taken care of and they can get their job done better. A lot of times I'm bold enough to say, if I can't help you make money or save you money or give you a competitive advantage, which probably gives you one of those other two, you probably should fire me. I'd request it to be done because we're really talking about taking care of them. So when you think about casting a vision for Pantheon, let's start there because everyone can do that. Everyone can give that client experience to ensure that we're taking care of our clients. Now, where are we going? I think that we're gonna find that that's a successful vision and that we can continue to grow by adding more clients. What I love about growth is it really creates a lot of opportunity. It allows us to be, have specialized people. I talk about, I don't need an accountant right now. We're, we're at 20 people. For 100 people, I bet we're probably gonna need an accountant. Right now, we kind of switch back and forth who's dealing with which kind of HR issues. We don't have somebody in HR. We don't need somebody at our size. But that growth creates some opportunity. So where are we going? Yeah, I don't think we're growing to 10,000 people. That's not for me. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm plenty happy with where I'm at. I want to live to my potential, and I don't know that that potential has to be growing to a really large size. So, can I, okay. Um, so you're talking a little bit about growth. What... Do you think that there's a thing as growing too fast and how, if there is, how do you kind of keep that scaled back? Because you don't want to grow too fast and then it becomes out of control. That's not good for anybody. What are kind of your thoughts on that? The, there could be growing too fast. Um, and when you outlive your cash, <laughs> you outlive your personnel, you're, you're growing so fast that the new people aren't getting what you do because you haven't built your processes. There, there certainly can be a lot of grow too fast. I think there's a lot of tools to combat growing too fast. Um, some bring on private equity firms to, to fund them. Some bring on angel investors. Some, you know, if we're talking about the finance piece of it. Um, I think that has to really be within the owner's um, philosophy of what they feel like they can handle. If they want to grow big and grow very fast, too fast might not be too fast for them. They just need different tools to get there. For me, growing too fast would be would be 100% growth a year. That would, that would be a lot. We've been pulling 20, 25, 30% this past year. That's plenty to keep up with um, for, for me to handle. And, and it's very comfortable for me. I don't want to work 80-hour weeks. Um, that doesn't fit my other goals, as you saw, my family and, and where I want to be in life. Um, but I'm hiring the right people to help us get, get there as a team. Uh, talking a little bit about uh, company growth and your guys' vision, uh, which of your core values do you believe attribute to that? Oh, well, of our core values, uh, we innovate. So we want to make sure that we're bringing... Now, innovate is an interesting core value in our world because you'd think maybe in the technology world we're inventing something. More so, we're helping our clients, again, get back to utilizing the technology, to innovate with that technology, to do something for themselves. So part of that could be there. You know, how are we innovating? and growing with that innovation. We're in a tech field, so things definitely change and we have to innovate and that helps us with, with part of that growth. Our first core value is invested partner. And we wanna make sure that we're an invested partner with each other, with, you know, their, if we're looking at an employee standpoint from the company, I'm invested in the company. But in the end of the day, I really wanna be invested in our clients. And I think our clients will feel that. And I think that attributes to our growth. They want, partners want to continue to work with us. New partners want to work with us because we're really invested in what they're doing. It's not about what we're doing. Good question. Any other thoughts? Because I'm going to try to rewind right in to see if this dovetails back into our story. Um, a little bit of what's going on. Um, we had a lot of changes in getting into a peer group. There was a couple different things that we had to do to get... Um, smarter, more mature, things that I didn't know about. Back to, you know, hiring the smartest people that you, you can at the time, or at least outsourcing parts of that. A great sales process was key. How to market was key. You know, I'd sit behind a computer and try to put something together in Word and make it look nice. Yeah, that's not the tool you use. You get a marketing firm that knows how to use all the Adobe products, products and make it look great. But there's a ton of, you know, marketing philosophy behind that and how to make something look good. The use of white space and repetitive and all the things that I didn't know anything about, we have to find somebody to do that. And it, it just accelerates after you can get that expert on board. So that's the challenge when you're small, all right? You're doing it all. Do it to your best of your ability. Read your book. Try to figure it out. But if you can bring on a team faster, get those experts to buy into where you're going or pay for them to help you with that, it, it does accelerate things. And so we grew quickly through a lot of different parts of our business. Um, 
The other thing that that kind of starts, you know, no segue there. We're just going to jump into the next topic <laughs> is to think about um, ideal clients, you know, and we talked about closing a retail center. We talked about focusing business to business and we looked at managed services and we continue to dial in that we can be better as part of our core values to be invested as we have to know who we're investing into and what it takes to be the best at what we're doing there. If I were building dump trucks and back loaders and forklifts and they're all metal things that that construction guys use but is that can i build the best dump truck if i'm also building a backhoe can i build the best whatever it is if i'm also doing this other thing maybe the answer is yes maybe the answer is no can i service a client that has a thousand endpoints the same way i can a hundred endpoints or 10 endpoints where is some of that sweet spot not just for us but where a process spot is, where we're providing different services for people, it looks very different at different client sizes. So we started really looking into ideal client size. What, what is an ideal client profile? Is it in education? Is it in medical? Is it in professional services? Are those similar enough? Or are there some outliers there that just need to find a specialty in what they do, even if it's tech? And so that was some of the, the honing in too, is to figure out what that ideal client is. You know, if we're in car sales, if we're in banking, you know, are we going to be everything to everybody or are we going to be experts at something specific? And we've all been very blessed to be able to stay inside of our territory, hone in on what that looks like, but we haven't went to any verticals. And I've had certain peers talk about this because they do focus on just lawyers, just banks, just hospitality. But can you imagine what happened when we went through COVID and your IT business focuses only on hospitality? We had a little bit of a challenge this past year. You know, they weren't buying services quite like that with an 8% occupancy at, 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 you know, at any given rate during this past year. So, John, what do you think decides what the, how, how does a company decide what they're, if they're going to have that niche, they're just going to be in this area, that's where they're going to operate, and they can be very good at that, or they can do a bevy of things. Is it... Is it that company's capacity, whether that's personnel or other resources? Is it uh, just plain old expertise? What are we good at? I'm sure it's a combination of those things, but how do you and your company think about that? Right. You know, what's unique about that is that we work with a lot of different companies. And so when we talk to our clients and work with our clients and talk about their businesses, I do have that lens of a lot of different businesses and what they're serving. We've got an urgent care facility. What kind of products are they able, what kind of services are they able to do, and how far do they want to stretch themselves? I know a salon that I've been working with recently, and they talk about what types of you know business that they have in their own salon, and how far do they want to stretch themselves? Do they want to get into this type of beauty product line, or do they want to do focus you know more on men's haircuts? or they, like are you going to be everything to everyone? And I think one of the keys to that is to be willing to try, to dabble in it to some degree. And, and test the waters, right? I think some of these big things when people go all in on an idea because they're really excited about it, but they haven't thought it through, they haven't either done the market research, they haven't tested the market. I think a lot of testing has to go on. And does it fit, you know, have a lot of strategy conversations of is that gonna fit? Um, again, for us, a lot of trial and error. You see a whole bunch of things in my past that didn't work. Let's not try to do that. And if I wanted to be an expert at you know, retail stores, I bet I could do it but I'm probably gonna have to set aside some of these other things because they weren't working well together. So some, some, some of those pieces. I am going to move uh, the slide deck just a little bit forward because I think this last slide gives us all our big topics. And I know some of you can see that, you'll see that on screen, but some of these are the lessons learned and then we can dive into any of those given topics as well and talking about culture, talk about finance, talk about market, talk about sales, talk about any of these other pieces. We've talked a lot about finding peers in your industry. I think finding peers regionally is important too, because there's a finger on what happens in the, in the Midwest that's very different than happening in New York or in LA. It, it's just different environments, and we need to be able to communicate well with people around us, whether it be through a chamber of commerce or a business group or a BNI group. Um, there's a lot of ways to do that regionally besides the industry stuff that I've been talking about this morning. We talked a little bit about hiring a coach, you know, finding somebody that's done it and that's willing to teach you how to do it as well. Um, one is a give on a peer group. You're in a, a lot of give and take. 
On the coach side, the only give is your money and you get to take whatever they can teach you from, from a spot from there. So, you know, I know we talked this fall a bit about we were in the midst of COVID there. We're talking about pivoting and all of these things are, and just to your point about talking about, you know, how do we test a market? How do we decide what we're doing? A lot of it's that adapt, adjust, pivot. You have to be open for change. You have to be willing to talk to people, listen. And, and then at the end of the day, it's yours. You have to make that decision. Yeah, so we took, took the question out of, my, out of my mouth a little bit there, but I'll ask it in a different way. So I remember last fall, like you said, we were talking and we were talking about pivoting and it seems like we all hear pivot so much in our daily lives. Now it's nauseating. Everyone's pivoting. Our companies are pivoting. Our classrooms are pivoting. But it's true, right? And I think, John, you demonstrated how your company was really well equipped to do that during COVID. You're a technology company. Um, but as we look back at your story, I mean, you started out in technology at the beginning of computers, at the beginning of the internet boom. What do you think made yourself and your company able to innovate and adapt your products and how you deliver them to your clients over time? And what made you successful as you're doing that? Because uh, the technology and the internet are a lot different now than it was 20 years ago. We were talking about that a little bit beforehand. Uh, the panel, I mean, we're talking about different forms of social media and everything that we use and things like that. It's different, right? So what what has helped you adapt and change over time and ensured that you were successful as well? There are so many answers to that question. <laughs> there are so many answers. Uh, s starts to come with, you know, to be open, to be open to change, certainly. Because um, we, we've always done it that way is not an answer I accept ever. Uh, and I get want to make sure that my staff challenges us on that regularly as we bring on new staff and somebody answers, you know, hey, why do we do this whatever? If somebody answers, because that's the way we've always done it, like, we need to have a different conversation, guys. Let's sit down. We may have, but there may be a reason for it. What are your ideas? Let me let me hear more from you. Why do you bring that up? Can we, can, let's talk about that. I'll share with you later where we were or how we got to that spot, but you may just have a good idea that we don't even have to revisit that. Let's, let's talk about that. So to be open to change. I think one of the things, too, is that we a lot of times hang out with the people that we're most like. And that's comfortable. But I don't know that that really you know, gets us to change, to think differently. So it's tough when I'm hiring and I've got the opportunity to hire somebody a lot like me, maybe my age, maybe some of my life experiences, has kids. Boy, I bet I relate really well to them. But now I have this uh, young person starting out in life, just graduated college, and they don't have these life experiences. And I'm looking at this one person going, gosh, I think I can relate to this person. They should be good for the company. They're a lot like me. Mm, but maybe we got some fresh ideas, some new education, some different ambitions, some different drive. Well, maybe they'll only be with the company two years. Maybe that's one of our best two years or and a half to be with this person and uh, get you know, their perspective from things and to share in different angles. So I, I think the diversity of the people you hang out with, um, to be open to change and, and to start that conversation, tell me more. Yeah, on your point about comparing someone similar or someone younger, going into jobs, interviewing, um, it's good to remember that, yes, you are young, um, but that's always a plus side because you don't have much experience to work from, so you can glue to their core values and they can teach you still when you're a new hire and stuff like that. So I feel like that would be a great thing to look into as well. And we've got a lot of open pages to write in, right? We haven't exactly. written the whole story yet. Like, where are you going? And I like to have that conversation. I like to talk about career development. And when those who choose to leave us, I hope never leave us because we were a bad employer. Because when we sit down and have a good exiting interview conversation, it's almost every time this was the great place to work. This has been a great life experience for me. I'm taking this opportunity because you've helped me grow to get to this next spot, or we're moving, or we're doing something else. But it's not because they're like, this sucks, I don't wanna do this ever again. So uh, as, as your company grew and you stuck with it all this time, did you live your brand throughout that whole thing? Like, did you promote your brand a lot, you know, like apparel or just talking with all your friends and family about your brand, and do you see that a lot in uh, your employees that you hire? Great, I love it. So well, let's move right, right to like branding and marketing, and where does that go? Branding 
can cost a lot of money, right? Like, let's think about Coca-Cola. Let's think about who, you know, the f folks that advertised during the Super Bowl and what kind of money they spent to build a brand. Back to a little bit your question about, you know, how do you pick what you're gonna do and who is that audience gonna be? If you look at like the percentage of money that people spend on their marketing or branding by different industries, you can see some pay a lot, like double digits. In our industry, we're looking at more like 1%, you know, a lot smaller number. So what do we do about that branding? What are, how are we marketing to the people that we want to engage with? And I hopefully will answer your whole question as soon as I round that whole corner. We're very targeted. We're very targeted because we know exactly what kind of customers we're going after. And we can really build lists around it. We can figure out what size companies they are, what si you know, how many employees they have, what kind of funding they have. You know, do they value technology at the end of the day? So for us, in a marketing sense, we're really not putting out the billboard. We're not having to put out a, a television ad. It doesn't make any sense for us. A lot of following up with f folks there. But when we think about our brand, how do we continue to build it stronger? Yes, we've had local apparel forever, and I pay for a lot of, of local apparel because I think it's really important as part of the team. But I want a little bit of buy-in to see if it's working. And so in that specific instance, we do a 50% uh, compensation for, for apparel. You've got to wear a shirt anyway. You're going to buy one. If you put my logo on, I'll pay for half of it. Let's do that. Everyone seems to do that. We're sitting there on a Zoom call, and I'm looking across, and people are working at home, and they've got their company wear on. And they don't have to see anyone for the day except their coworkers. They feel proud to be part of that brand. But we could talk also about brand story. You know, what's that story? And it's interesting, when we did an analysis of our website recently, we put one of these trackers on that sees where people go and how long they stay there and where their mouse was. You know what the number one page on our site was? Our history. And I'm like, yeah, it's not really written all that well. I think we could improve on that. <laughs> But that's what people do. And so when we go meet with a new client or we meet with a new prospect for an employee, they'll talk to us about our history. I found it really interesting, John, that. I see where your company has been and where it's going because of this. They go to that. And so if you want to build a story, building your brand, that story of what we're doing, where we're going, I think it comes back to casting that vision. How do you get people to come along with you for the ride? You know, whether it be employees, whether it be new customers, Tell them where you're going. Tell them what you're doing. And don't be shy about that. This also goes off of your branding, kind of. Um, but in the fall, we talked about um, how you first started your business and you were going Wasika, right? It was for your neighborhood mostly. How did you switch from neighborhoods, like homes, to the industry, like buildings, businesses, and stuff like that? Sure, sure. There's uh, there's two facets I'm thinking about there. First, you know, like, hey, can I just pick this up and go to Fairbolt or Oatana or somewhere else? And then we just saw <laughs> through a presentation, you know, oh, failed, failed, failed. Like, I, I, you must have to just stay home and, and do what you're doing. That's where that kind of double side goes, is that more so the residential versus our business to business, that residential didn't seem to sink in quite right. You know, you weren't the hometown kid in that next environment. You weren't the big box, so you kind of got stuck in the middle, and it, and it didn't feel like it had success. Again, I think if I put, poured all my efforts into that, we could figure it out. That was a tough road to go up. Um, we look at more of that business-to-business -business side. It's interesting enough, coming from Wasika and knowing that less than 10% of our entire business comes from my hometown today. How did we bridge that gap? I, I think we became m much better at what we did. I think some parts of it is is the lack of certain type of competition in our area too. Um, there's certain things that we used to do that we wouldn't do today. So let's say there's another provider in the area and they have a, a level of service here and, and that price also matches that. We would come in here, we were just less mature and it was less money. And that client may say, I'd rather save the money, we're gonna try Pantheon out. And Quite honestly, we probably offered a lower solution, a lower level solution, whether it be, I won't talk about it in security today because we didn't talk about security you know, 15 years ago like we do today. But there's other pieces to that. But we were there and we met the clients there at, the, at their needs. Yet as we grew, we also matured. And prices had to kind of follow pieces of that because, well, there's just more to pay for. And it got more complicated and security got harder and backup and data and it just goes on and on. But we elevated. Many of our clients elevated with us, so they got to grow with us. And now we're at that spot where then we meet up with somebody else and we bring on that new client that is already at that spot or needs some help to get there. 
Is that to say that there's clients that require more than beyond what we do? Usually in size, and then we're not that provider. So knowing that target market and knowing that there's other clients like them, other client partners that are similar to them. Oh, do you do any other banks? Yeah, yeah, we've got other banks. Uh, oh, that's good. I like to be in like company. You know, well, tell us about your services with them. S things like that. Yeah, and then it helps for if you can kind of go off, promote each other for your clients, can promote you, and you could probably promote them as well. So that's always fun working with different industries as well. Exactly, and I and I think about this. You know, we talk a lot. Uh, we're talking a lot about my business, and what I want to make sure is the lesson gets carried through to any business. How do we do that? We're a car dealership. We're a salon. We're a whatever. We have to talk about how how they're going to find that spot for themselves. And I think, you know, the way they carry themselves in their own business is going to attract people to what they're doing if they can communicate it clearly. So I, I think it's it's industry agnostic. Um, to get into those core pieces of business. Like, let's describe what we're doing and then do it well and consistent. I mean, how many here love a McDonald's hamburger for its taste? Yeah, you know, it, it's a little bit there, right? But do you really like the Juicy Lucy better? Yeah, that's a good hamburger. But we go to McDonald's because we know, the, we know what price we're going to pay, we know what we're going to get, and it's going to be consistent. You know, being consistent in a business is so key. So I have a couple questions here. Um, you started your business in your hometown. You moved it there. How Was that a more positive thing or a little bit more like a negative? Because when you're in your hometown, it can be positive because people really want to support you. They know you. They grew up with you. But at the same time, there also has to be that need in that hometown. Or people are just like, mm, you know, maybe I don't exactly know them that well. Did you find that more of a positive or a negative? And then along with that, um, was it, what was your reasoning behind also going back to Asika? Was it because it was your hometown or did you see that need there? Whew. Big question, lots of different answers, I think for a lot of different people. Inspiring entrepreneurs that wanna start something, we have to start thinking about what your business plan is and whether that would be an advantage, a benefit to what you're doing for us is your question. I think it was a positive. I think that's how we got some name recognition. What Was there a need there? Yeah, that's part of the story that I probably left out in this. So as uh, I'm working in the Twin Cities in an IT industry, building computers, I'm interviewing for a job in Iowa, and I'm driving from the Twin Cities to Iowa. If you look on a map, Wasika's in between, going through my hometown. Stop for a cup of coffee, the coffee shop I eventually bought, and they were talking about or bringing some internet places. And there was like, well, where do you get a computer? And I'm like, well, I can buy, build a computer for you. And it felt like there was a need there. And so we did a little bit of market analysis, not like good marketing people do, but at least we asked some questions. Would there be a need? What kind of businesses are there? Would they like the types of services? We, what kind of business could we craft? And this is with my original business partner and talking through that. I think at the end of the day, yes, yes. It was definitely a benefit. Um, I was involved in a lot of things in high school. My parents were involved in, are involved in our community. So there was some pieces of that. My business partner's dad was on the school board. There's some name recognition there. There's some trust there. Um, you know, I, I kept a pretty clean life in high school, so I wasn't that kid that you didn't want to, to work with. So there's a piece of that. I think also it alludes to our industry of technology. Here's some young kids that know something about it. We don't know anything about it. I might put just a bit of trust in that person because they're just young and it was part of our industry. So I think there's a lot of little combinations there that, that worked out that got us at least going. Again, a lot of challenges in starting a business, but at least we got some advantages of being in our hometown. So were there any negatives though? And then how did you combat those negatives of being in your hometown? I would say the negative would be not something that's core to me, but I could see it from a different lens. So. I want to take care of my neighbor so much that I'll do it at my expense. And so sometimes when there was that customer service issue, it was like, oh, I'm just going to have to go to the nth degree with this. And maybe that's what helped build our core values to really be caring about what we do and made us who we are today. So in the end of the day, I'm not sure that's a negative. It turns to be the positive. Um, I was speaking somewhere recently and somebody had said that, yeah, you must be an entrepreneur. You just see everything as a positive. And I'm like, I don't know about that. There's plenty <laughs> of problems still in life. But 
it, it's to that point. So if, if you want to look at it from that lens of a negative, yeah, the challenge is that I wasn't business-minded so much as to make sure that, that every transaction was either profitable or best for the business or, or whatnot. I always was trying to make that win-win situation, and sometimes even that their win had to come at my loss, which was tough in business. Good questions. And I guess as we kind of wrap up here, flipping the switch, how do you maintain a work and family life balance to anybody in any industry, any job? How do you go home and go, okay, we're flipping off the work. How do I focus on my family as, as something that, that's a value to me? How do you go through with that on your daily basis? Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, uh, there's a lot of checks and balances uh, with with my family when I get home. Um, I was gifted a box not too long ago. It's a little wooden box, a little slide cover. It fits about the size of a cell phone. And so it was interesting. We were at dinner a couple months ago, and um, my wife's father was over, and uh, he was checking his phone for something. While we were sitting at dinner, and one of my children go into my office and grab the box and open it. Grandpa, can you put your phone in here? <laughs> he just, pardon me? You know, and it's like, when we sit at the table, we, we, we hang out together. And so finding those things, you can get a box or not, whatever, find those things that, that you can shut it off for. Uh, I'm allowed to work at night, or I allow myself to work at night. When we're super busy, and I know that if I can take two hours here and get something significant done, I can take four or six hours off somewhere else when it's more meaningful for my family. So I think there's some negotiation to that. Other people are wired differently. I need to shut it off at 5 o'clock. It'll be there tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I'm not going to do anything. I don't need to bring my laptop home. I don't need to email on my cell phone. Um, different people have to approach it differently. And I think it's with the people that you love and the people that you're around, you need to agree on that. You need to come to that understanding. Uh, bullying your way through one way or another on that decision isn't going to work because that's who you're doing it for. I love that question, Jackson, just because especially now during the, the last year now, I guess it's everyone's, a lot of people, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people are working from home and you're, well, their work life is also their home life. So it makes things very complicated. And I love what you had to say, John, about uh, everyone's balance is probably going to be a little different. And don't, and something I would say is don't let others impose, other than your loved ones, don't let others impose their work life balance on you. It's you, it's what makes you happy. If you, like you said, John, if you know that working those two hours at night is going to free you up for something else that you'll be able to do with your family or your company later on, then that's worth doing t to you, and that's your balance. And I think that that's important for everyone to find that for themselves, and I think that that's been something that a lot of people, students included, have struggled with now, being able to have the ability to shut it off at the end of the day because you don't go anywhere. You're working at your desk in your house or your office, and it's it's tough now, especially it's the 24-7 work environment, school environment right now. So I love that question, Jackson. And, and, and it's a lot about building routines. And, and it almost sounds contradictory what I'm saying. You know, I want to be flexible. I have my stuff. But it's also that routine. You know, when our kids started first homesco uh, homeschooling, schooling at home, distance learning, how are we going to do that routine? What was lunch going to look like even in our household? Like, we're going to have to feel this out a little bit because we've learned a lot from working from home, whether it be students or whether it be from, from business, you know, and, and your work, your work life, is how do we work from home and, and testing the waters. I mean, we've looked at that at one of our slides, too. Like, how do we continue to adapt? My oldest kind of rolls out of bed at, like, you know, 9 o'clock, and she kind of just opens up her Chromebook and starts working on it. But she's doing great, you know. My youngest needs to get up in the morning and have breakfast and then have a routine to sit down at a desk and work on, you know, there's just, you've got to look at how different people work. You know, she, uh, my oldest got home from, from uh, some sporting thing yesterday. Uh, was she at swimming? Was she at volleyball? I don't know. You know, you just pick them up and drop them off at some point. Um, but she got home and is like, hey, you know, you got anything else left to do? Here it is, 930 at night. And she's like, yeah, I got one more assignment to do. And I'm thinking, oh, man, you got to get to bed. Like, you got to get up in the morning. Yeah, no, that was when she was going to be productive again. She had gotten, you know, energized by going to um, athletics, getting her, you know, blood flowing, uh, you know, those endorphins, whatever. And then she gets home and it's like, hey, my brain's functioning again. Like she can now go another hour and get her best work done. So figure out when your best work is in this work from home environment. It's tough, but there's a part of a routine to it, too, that you're going to stick with. But everyone's routine may be a little different. So kind of going off the work from home um, environment a little bit, 
when this is all over, hopefully uh, in the next few months, um, when people can start going back to work, or more importantly, your employees can start going back to work, now that you have learned what it's like to work from home, I'm sure there are some benefits from it as well. What is kind of your step for that? Like, will you maybe give people the option if they want to work from home? Or will it be like, no, we kind of want you in the office more? Kind of what are your next steps for that work environment? Sure, and I think that's got two lenses always to it as a challenge for me is I look at our staff, but I also look at the people that we support because that's the question they're asking me. I have other business owners that are clients of ours that are looking to me going, you know, we've been pretty successful at this. I feel like we're not making this. Like how do, we're having a lot more business conversations than we are technology cases. Now, sometimes we have to have that technology conversation to support whatever the business solution that we're talking about is, but let's start there. And for us, yeah, w I think we've all learned to adapt a lot differently. We can be productive at home. We can work from home. It is an option. For other people, we have to figure out what that metric is of success when you are working from home. You know, we do it for school. Like, can my grades still stay up to where they're supposed to be or not? If that's a not, then we better get back in the classroom, right? You know, are you that kind of student? For us and, and work, how can we figure out the grade for our staff to say, are you being productive at home or not? You know, you're taking a couple hours off in the afternoon because you do whatever, but does your job elude itself to be able to do it some other time? Or are we an eight to five and you just have to be at your desk, wherever your desk might be? And then can your desk be at home or does it have to be here? I'm the receptionist at Mayo, guess where I can't work? Yeah, at home. You know, I mean, you're the receptionist. People walk in the door and you say, hello, there's no virtual to this, this business. So we're gonna have to think about our jobs. We're gonna have to think about the positions. Can they be productive? Can they be uh, a hybrid? Can they be at home some days and not some days? I've got one staff that goes, that works two days at, right now at home. His most productive days, he doesn't get interrupted. And they're like, John, just keep him at home five days a week. That'd be perfect. Well, yeah, but the other three days he's interacting with people to help them get their job done too. So he's a key role there. So. You're really gonna have to look at each job role, figure out what that is, test the waters, try trial and error, adapt, pivot to be there. So it gives us a lot of new opportunities though. We're, we're, we blew open the doors. There's a lot of different ways we can do stuff now. So bringing it back to the flexibility um, of your, you know, you need the flexibility of your schedule, working from home, schooling from home as well. There's also making the most of the day, which is the two hours working as the four hours with your family or your work. The way I've seen it lately is you still try to make the most of your day. Like you try to do different stuff at home or go outside and still do socially distanced things to make the days go by not faster, but you enjoy your time more. And I feel like that gives more productivity productivity than anything lately because of how dark these times can get, especially with winter time as well. Not really a question, but no, I was just you know, but it's a great point of topic of conversation, yeah. right? So what do we have for core quality of life? You know, I think that's where we start. How do you, how do you help with quality of life? I can't take care of your quality of life. I'm not you, but we can have a conversation about it. What makes quality of life for you? What makes quality of life for you? Do you like to get outdoors? Do you like to, and that's part of that leadership piece, right? You know, I have a partner in Vancouver that, boy, once his staff went home and they hunkered down and there's a fear of being in a metropolitan area and really getting out, like getting people back to the office was really tough. And he went through this process and I, I commend him so much for how he, he went through this piece, but he interviewed each person and talked to them about these types of things. What was life like before? What is life like now? What are your fears? What are some of the things that you've now found as a quality of life and how can we adapt toward that? And so we talked a lot about a quality of life and setting those routines. I like to get outside. It's healthy to get outside. I want to exercise. This is the tough one for me during the day. Exercise, like eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock I'm working. And I don't like to work out at 5 a.m. because I'm just not even awake hardly. And at night, I don't want all that moving on because I can't fall asleep. I want to work out in the middle of the day. Think about how much we've been able to adjust our lives to fit that now in and say, no, we can do different things. And how much like being enclosed opens your eyes to see how much you love in life and how much you want to explore too. I, it's 
a hit and a miss with this year, but honestly, it's opening up a lot of people's eyes and I try to make the positives out of it. So Absolutely, absolutely. And I think a lot of us in our lives uh, found out that we kind of actually like hanging out with our families. <laughs> we have been so busy in the summers of running everywhere for everyone, for everything, for their purpose. And when we couldn't do that anymore, we did it for ours. Our quality of life this past summer had went up significantly too. Those are the pieces I want to grab onto as we may go post-COVID some days. Great conversations, guys. Thanks for having me back. Thanks for the dialogue. I hope our audience got something out of our conversations. We've went a lot of different directions in a business story of my own, but hopefully it relates to where you're going, what you're doing, what you're thinking about. If you're wanting to be an entrepreneur yourself, if you've got a great idea, uh, I definitely encourage you to get around peers that do the same thing. If you're thinking about marketing, you're thinking about accounting, get with those types of people. Find great companies that find your core values and align yourself there. You'll be a lot happier in a lot of the things we've been talking about. Thanks, guys, for your time today. This has been fun. Thank you, John, for that inspiring message. Now, before we adjourn, I want to remind everyone to please respect all conference attendees, presenters, and staff members. If you encounter any problems participating in these sessions throughout the week, please contact us at mncoldeca at gmail.com for assistance. We encourage you all to attend each of the workshops and networking sessions that, throughout this conference. And remember to take this opportunity to learn from business professionals and connect with members from all over the state. If you are unable to attend one of these sessions live, please don't worry, as we will be recording each of them and posting them onto the MN Collegiate Deca YouTube channel. As an added bonus, everyone has received an email with a link to your own Deca bingo card. At the end of each session, a new bingo symbol will appear for you all to mark down onto your personalized card. Mark your cards after each session and let us know when you get a bingo at mncoldeca at gmail.com. It is important to note that you will need to provide a photo of each session you attended in order to validate your bingo. So please be sure to watch the screen for the symbol and remember to take a selfie when attending each of the daily briefings, workshops, events, and the opening and closing sessions. Each of the winners will receive a $5 Caribou Coffee gift card via email at the end of the conference. Now here is Madison to give us an overview of the schedule for next week. Thank you, Jack Pine. Today we invite you to join us at 1 p.m. for the Meet the Pros workshop, where you will get insider tips on how to wow your judges from former competitors and judges. At 3 p.m., meet your state officer candidates during the Meet the Candidates session. All voting delegates are required to attend or view this session. All DECA members are encouraged to join. At 7 p.m., join us for some trivia and networking during our trivia game session via Zoom and Kahoot. Each morning at 8 a.m., check out the daily briefing on our YouTube channel for more information about the day's events and announcements. On Wednesday, competitive event competition will begin with morning and afternoon competition session. At 6 p.m., join John Krauth of Uji professional services for the resume and interview workshop to get next level tips on how to impress your future employers. On Thursday, competitive events will continue with morning and afternoon sessions. Join Gage Donovan, Collegiate DECA president, for his Be a Champion workshop at 6 p.m. On Friday, competition events will continue with morning and afternoon sessions. At 12 noon p.m., there will be a Dress for Success workshop by Men's Warehouse. We will take a break over the weekend to catch up on any sessions you might have missed. On Monday, competition for any events running finals will take place in the morning. Be sure to join us on our YouTube at 7 p.m. that evening for the premiere of our grand awards ceremony and closing session. Cheer on your fellow competitors and find out the results of your state officer election. I will now hand it over to Zach to call this session to close.
Thank you, Madison. Our DECA bingo symbol for this session is now on the screen. You should have received your DECA bingo card in an email this morning. Be sure to mark your DECA bingo card and attend more sessions for a chance to win Caribou Coffee gift cards. We hope you enjoyed this session and get the most out of your conference experience as you take it to the next level. Good luck to all competitors, and we can't wait to see all of you at our closing session next week. I now adjourned our 2021 opening session.